So good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here and for the opportunity to talk about robotics. Uh, I'm uh, my my uh, position, my my job, my role in the world is um, director of robotics at SRI International in uh, Menlo Park. Um, I'm also the president of an organization called Silicon Valley Robotics, and I'll I'll talk a little bit about um, my perspectives on on robotics related to both of these um, both of these positions. Uh, <laughs> The, the thing to highlight uh, with respect to SRI, I don't know how many of you, how, how many people know about SRI and, and have heard of SRI? Okay, so it's a pretty good showing. So we're usually the, the most important company uh, people have never heard of. So um, uh, SRI uh, is uh, essentially a spinoff from Stanford and uh, it's about 65 years old and, and our main uh, role in life is to do contract research but to work at the, the leading edge. And there's a robotics program as one of 40 different programs. Um, our, um, the, the mantra I like to use is to invent, apply, and uh, commercialize technologies. Uh, SRI has been involved in robotics and, um, uh, throughout, you know, as long as there have been robotics, but more recently we're really focused on technologies that will, um, uh, are supporting this, this uh, emergence of a, of a new uh, personal robotics marketplace. The, the type of contract research that we do is funded by a number of different agencies, so uh, by government agencies as well as uh, um, by uh, commercial companies. And so in this uh, uh, position that I'm in, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, we're, we're actually funded by uh, DARPA under four different uh, programs, and that uh, gives me the opportunity to see what is happening at the leading edge of R&D. Um, we have several uh, um, good commercial clients that gives me the opportunity to see what's happening in the commercial space, what, what are companies out in the world um, doing right now to respond to this uh, emerging uh, robotics, uh, robotics marketplace. Um, but SRI also has a very strong um, commercialization model and uh, we've taken advantage of that in our program and we've uh, also spun out two companies over the last uh, year or so. Uh, Redwood Robotics and Grab It, and I'll talk about uh, that. But that also gives um, uh, some insight into what's happening in the in the early stage market as well. Uh, so I feel very fortunate that I'm uh, have this view um, right uh, of, of different perspectives um, around what's happening in in robotics. And our focus is uh, looking at low cost manipulation technologies, telemanipulation, and then uh, component technologies that allow you to create new kinds of uh, robotic systems. Probably our biggest claim to fame is the fact that Intuitive Surgical, um, the, the most successful robotics company, um, spun out of our lab, um, but that was in 1995. So that was a well, well before my time. I've been at SRI for five years. Um, but there, the heritage of, of the kind of work that SRI was doing related to uh, intuitive is really important to what's happening today. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the other images uh, that are uh, on the screen. So from the Silicon Valley robotics perspective, there, there's a really good story here, I think, in that um, it's very common throughout the U.S. in areas where there are strong robotics activity for there to be a, a cluster representing um, uh, uh, the robotics organizations, the industry of robotics. And um, there really uh, wasn't that much activity along those lines uh, in Silicon Valley, there was lots of robotics activity, but really no uh, um, kind of organization. So we hosted a meeting uh, at SRI back in 2010, and it was really just, hey, everyone doing robotics that we know, do you want to just come and talk about whether we need a cluster? And up till that time, Boston and Pittsburgh really were dominating uh, the news around uh, what was happening in robotics. Um, over the last couple of years, that first meeting led to a working group and then ultimately led to uh, um, the founding of formal uh, industry organization called Silicon Valley Robotics and uh, ADEPT, Bosch, SRI, and Willow put in uh, a tiny bit of seed money to support that and, and somewhere in the room uh, Andre Key is the uh, acting uh, managing director of uh, Silicon Ro Valley Robotics. Andre, where are you? Are you here? There she is right up front. Um, so uh, the, the um, really great thing about uh, the timing here is that um, uh, robotics, a lot of things started to happen in robotics and happened in Silicon Valley. Uh, and over the last couple of years, this organization has, has, the timing has been just very good as far as 
creating a place where people who are interested in robotics, trying to connect with other people, and coming outside of Silicon Valley, um, how, do, how do you uh, get connected to the kind of innovation um, funding technology that, that exists here? And, and Silicon Valley uh, Robotics has really done a great job in supporting that. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, th this is a list of the companies that attended the first meeting. Um, there's probably the same number of companies, if not more, that are, are new companies, new robotics companies that have started. I'm not going to try to name them all because I'll offend the ones that I, that I don't name. But you can see uh, on svrobo.org the, um, the list of companies. And um, this is a great organization. If you're interested in getting involved uh, and connected to the robotics community, I would say this is, would be the starting point. And uh, we host uh, every year during uh, National Robotics Week in April, uh, a robotics uh, block party at um, Stanford, and this this is actually my favorite event in robotics, and it's the few it's the only place I've ever seen where you can have uh, uh, established companies like Bosch and Adept and SRI with startup companies with uh, um, university uh, researchers and and projects all engaging uh, with the public and and. Uh, as we've, we've been saying, the uh, robotics does does have this uh, broader appeal, and uh, it adds to the excitement of, um, of what's happening uh, right now. So, I, I'm, I have a couple of different um, perspectives, and I'm I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I'll I'll uh, try to uh, have a little bit of, of flow. But my goal is to give you my view of what I see happening in robotics, and and how. I think things are transitioning and, and where it will end up. So right now, there is a lot of activity. There's a lot of companies, new companies. Um, I think the uh, people know about Rethink and Baxter. They, they know about Kiva because of the exit and, and uh, the 700 plus million dollars that Amazon paid for it. But that really points to the activity that's going on in manufacturing, um, distribution, warehousing. Um, there, there is this. Um, focal point right now of sort of business to business applications. Uh, you have uh, less expensive, um, lightweight, uh, mobile manipulation technologies that are, that are being applied there and there are benefits in terms of efficiency and uh, uh, driving, uh, especially if you look at with warehousing, um, all of the same day delivery creates requirements to have warehouses closer to population centers so the costs are, are higher and they're doing anything they can to drive down margins and, and there's a great uh, um, benefit of using uh, robotics technology. Uh, other areas um, that are getting a lot of activity now are, is agriculture uh, and uh, education actually, main, mainly uh, STEM oriented uh, kinds, of, um, kinds of products but uh, I think that's going to evolve and grow um, in, in ways that we don't realize. So, the two companies, Gravit and Redwood, that spun out of our group are really addressing uh, this market, this more business-to-business, -business, warehousing, logistics, light manufacturing. Uh, Gravit, in particular, is based on a technology that we developed at SRI called electroadhesion. Some of you have may, know, may have seen it in its form uh, um, supporting wall climbing robots. And it, it's basically uh, a technology, it's the same technology as when you rub a balloon on your hair and stick it to a wall, but we know how to design it into a compliant surface and turn it on and off with a switch. So in robotics, there's lots of different applications you can think of, but we've uh, identified an, an opportunity to apply it in uh, material handling. And what you see here is, is what is typically a vacuum gripper kind of application but you, you normally cannot handle all of these different items with just a vacuum gripper. So uh, it just shows a very, uh, the ability of the technology to, um, to grasp using electrostatic forces a, a, a wide range of um, objects. Um, but it can do it at a very lightweight, very low cost, three orders of magnitude less power than uh, what is required for vacuum grippers, um, quiet, um, and inexpensive. So uh, this company spun out and, and we uh, are expecting, there probably will be an announcement sometime in the fall relative to the, to, uh, to the funding uh, for Gravit. But its customers are many of the other manipulator companies that are serving this warehouse and, and distribution market. So it's an end effector technology. Um, so the other thing that's happening is there is this ecosystem that's evolving uh, f that, uh, that relates to the personal and uh, service robotics industry. And it's happening right here in Silicon Valley. 
um, and beyond, but Silicon Valley is very much uh, uh, active and, and in many ways leading. I, I actually often refer to um, San Francisco as Robot City. So I'm down in Menlo Park and I say I'm going up to Robot City. There's so many robotics companies that are located here now. Um, and they're all leading edge uh, companies. It's, it's just a great uh, place right now um, because of the, uh, the networking and the energy that's going on. Um, but, I, but to look at, uh, so I, I started robotics in 1988 and I was a graduate student and I've done university research and um, worked at a, a university research center and I did product development and business development, and then before SRI, I was the general manager for an early stage uh, medical robotics company. The, I, I've really come um, over the last couple of years to stop thinking about robotics as a separate technology and more as um, a, tech, uh, a component technology that's part of the continuum of technologies that are now evolving uh, uh, the, in the marketplace. And if you look at the, the kinds of uh, components that have evolved um, from computing, you see a lot of uh, robot type technologies. And um, what's really missing right now is manipulation, accessible manipulation, and then full, fully robust awareness, perception, and planning. But uh, an insight that I have is I was, I'm sure some of you have seen the 60 Minutes episode of, a few months ago, and um, it, it was kind of disappointing because it, it basically used the same old cliches about robots taking jobs and being afraid of robots, but the thing that um, was poignant to me was that in the very early on, they showed these kiosks, and they, were, they referred to robotic kiosks as taking away jobs in airports, and so that was the first time in my life I ever heard anyone refer to as a kiosk as a robot, and I, you know, I was offended for... Uh, whatever reason, but a few days later I realized that they, they kind of did us a favor because now there are more robots out there than we even thought before. And I even um, look at if that, if that kiosk is a robot, then the, um, the phones we have in our pocket that are doing the same service um, are also robots. And it just adds to this idea that robots are not a, a separate technology but just a um, part of a continuum. So the, the other thing that's happening is that there is this uh, huge rush to create lower cost robot technologies that are uh, more generalizable. So um, I like to say that the days of the $100,000 robot are over. So the, um, the, the Da Vinci robot right now is $1.8 million. It has a monopoly for the time being and, and so they can charge what they want. And then you have the Roomba at the other scale and, and uh, products like it that are in the hundreds of dollars range. But all of the in-between technologies and especially manipulation technologies are being driven towards much lower cost points. Um, so, so an example, the, uh, I'm sure all of you have seen telepresence robots. There's two of them in the, in the Bay Area, at least two of them, Double Robotics and Suitable. Um, the thing that's uh, striking to me about this is not um, you know, that this, this platform, it's an interesting platform and some business models are emerging, but the fact that there are like two dozen companies that have telepresence robots. It's, it's, uh, it just demonstrates that there's a commoditization of this technology. And I, I bet you if we, uh, you know, um, uh, this room, if we wanted to build our own system, we could probably in two days have a platform up and running. Um, we'd find the components in the, in, within a couple miles of here and be able to build something that had all the features of, of the systems that we see in front of us. Uh, a thing that I like to highlight, though, that, uh, that I think is often overlooked is that these are mobile teleconferencing systems, and they are uh, mobile teleconferencing drones. There's a human in the loop that's operating them, and I think that's really important and, uh, um, because it is a way that, uh, that technologies are enabled. Robotics technology uh, is, is enabled, and the Da Vinci is another example of that. So, if you look at the kinds of things that we're doing at SRI, here's an example of a, a new platform that we're developing called the Taurus. Um, it's, it's been out for a little bit and we're in the process of commercializing it. But the control paradigm is exactly the same as for the Da Vinci. The, the dexterity, uh, the remote dexterity that, you, that you're able to convey across the system is exactly the same. And, and so you have a $1.8 million Da Vinci system. Um, this platform is designed to sell for around $30,000 to uh, municipal bomb squads, um, but it's, it's really a form of manipulation drone, and the, uh, the 
application of it, the application of the skill is enabled through the person um, being in the loop. And I think that's really important. Um, also from the point of view that if you look more generally at manipulation, there is a lot of effort to develop lower cost solutions. So um, I'm showing you here a video of a, a, a low cost robot hand that we developed under a DARPA program. And this was motivated by the fact that there are really good bomb defeat robots used in the military, but they are roughly a quarter of a million dollars each and they're being destroyed by $10 roadside bombs. So they're saving soldiers' lives, um, but there's a mismatch there. So, the, so DARPA w wanted to create lower cost technologies uh, to try to um, even the, um, that imbalance. So this, uh, you know, typical robot hands are in the fifty dollars to $80,000 hands, and they're pretty clunky. Uh, this is um, a very dexterous, uh, has a, a strong sensor suite in it, and um, the bill of materials is $500. So uh, this is a hand that we designed that can be uh, developed, um, brought to market, and should be um, able to be commercialized for under $1,000. Uh, the Redwood Robotics, which spun out, was inspired by the work going on in this program, but we really wanted to um, create um, a low-cost uh, robotic arm. We knew the, the activity that was going on with Rethink Robotics and um, saw an opportunity to get something out into the market more quickly. So uh, this, this, the technology I just showed you is not in uh, part of uh, Redwood per se, but the idea of a lower-cost manipulation platform. Um, it's in uh, stealth mode right now. It's in the, in the process of uh, raising funds, but we are targeting lower cost robotic arms for um, light manufacturing kinds of applications. One thing to point out is we are uh, funded, we were funded to develop this low cost hand. Um, the uh, DARPA liked the work we did so much that they're funding us to develop a low cost arm. Um, so we are in a position to, you know, what we're targeting is a, uh, a torso-like robot that could be in the four to $5,000 range. So you're starting to see the, an idea that you can have manipulation technologies that are in a price range that sound a little bit like where personal computers were um, you know, 20 or so years ago. And I think the key thing there is that if you look at how personal computers or the personal computing revolution occurred, you had this sort of large mainframes that went to still big computers but in, in B2B kinds of applications. And then uh, more accessible component technologies uh, were um, uh, being used by uh, hobbyists. So entre entrepreneurial class hobbyists then drove the personal uh, computer revolution. We're in a very similar situation right now where you have component technologies that are very accessible to an uh, entrepreneurial class of, of uh, robotic hobbyists. And these manipulation technologies, I think, will be available to that community in the next couple of years. There, there's uh, multiple labs working on them. And I think it's part of the last horizon of um, accessible hardware to really um, open up the, um, the opportunities for personal robotics. Uh, another thing to highlight is that uh, DARPA is also uh, sponsoring another robotics challenge. And if you haven't um, heard of this, you should go to DARPAroboticsChallenge.com or you can find it off the DARPA site. But this is a uh, competition um, around robots working in um, human engineered environments. So it's not about humanoids per se, but robots that can actually go into a human environment and use the tools that are uh, available there. And it was inspired by uh, Fukushima, where there was a, uh, we had a situation where there were robots inside of the facility, and they were worthless. They, they were basically just glorified camera holders. They couldn't touch switches. They couldn't do pull levers. They couldn't do anything that was worthwhile to mitigate the problems there. So the goal here is to have robots. So, so the challenge is having a robot that can drive a utility vehicle onto a facility, get out of the uh, vehicle, walk across a rubble strewn parking lot, open a door, go inside of a room, cut through a wall with a sawzall or similar tool, climb up a ladder, go across a catwalk, and close a valve. So that's the competition. The, my view is that, the, so I'm showing you here a, uh, a range of the, the, um, the big orange robot on the left is an um, a, uh, artist rendition of the robot that we're targeting for our program at SRI. Um, all the other robots are robots that are being developed by different teams throughout the world. Um, 
primarily in the U.S., but they are from all around the world. And my view is that the technology related to these platforms is much closer to reality than the uh, driving technology was for the first DARPA challenge. So the, this, the, the final challenge takes place in December of 2014, and I think we're going to see these technologies and um, applications very soon afterwards in 2015. So, I'm sorry? Uh, DARPA Robotics Challenge. <laughs> so, uh, um, I'll get a little bit philosophical, uh, but I, I think that uh, looking forward, I, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that, that robotics will become a lot more pervasive, but th there, you know, there's a media-driven image, and then I think there's the reality of how technologies emerge and become adopted. And in, in my view, there's a need. Ro robotics are not going to be adopted unless there is a real um, need, that there's a, um, sponsorship and uh, alignment with a market. And, and the way I think that happens is to start to understand that the robot is a part of an interface between the information world and the physical world. So there's a lot of data coming off of, of these robots. Um, and now when you have a human in the loop, as I've been describing, uh, you, you, and think about the surgical task. There are close to 500,000 surgical procedures done with a Da Vinci robot every year. All of the, this data is coming off of, that, uh, off of that device. Think as you go into other kinds of applications, the human in the loop kind of data that the robot will be collecting about how the human is performing and how the task is being performed. So I think the key thing here is not so much how do you that you can collect that information, but how you align it with business value. And I, I think that value is related to quality. And when I, you know, I, I like the idea of democratization of robotics. It means robotics is accessible. But I think from a business point of view, what, what robotics will do is democratize quality. So um, if you use a Da Vinci robot as a surgeon, you, uh, you can now uh, can, uh, carry out a surgical procedure, a very difficult, uh, minimally invasive procedure with less skill. So doctors that couldn't do it through the hand tools can actually do it with the um, Da Vinci robot. So you're not comparing to um, minimally invasive. You're really saying a, a doctor can't do that procedure unless they're using the Da Vinci robot. So um, I think as we align robotics with the quality uh, um, that, that you're providing and then align that with uh, business drivers in terms of documenting quality or guaranteeing quality. And another way I say this is, uh, why do we rank our children's hospitals? This, to me, is more compelling. So we, we're basically saying, here's a number one children's hospital, and we, um, that means every other child who doesn't go to that hospital doesn't get the best quality in, that we can offer. So if you have robotic systems that are capturing information about how care is delivered, and you're understanding that quality, then you can start to democratize access to quality. It's not just equal access to health care services, it's equal access to equal quality health care. And uh, this is a company in the Bay Area, Momentum Machines, uh, that, I th that um, is, is taking this message and applying it to uh, hamburgers. So uh, I think there's always a chuckle when you say there's a hamburger making robot, and a lot of people immediately jump to uh, the idea of McDonald's. But in this case, they're looking at how can you um, use a robot to create the high quality hamburgers that are part of uh, new, new kinds of restaurants and actually offer them at a lower uh, cost um, while maintaining quality. So this, this company is um, based right here in San Francisco and, and I think is, is really going to lead the way in, in showing how this kind of thinking can um, open, um, open up the market for robotics. And then my last corny message, um, I I think this is often overlooked again about how robots get out there. We're so focused on the technology and um, at the end of the day, robots are not successful unless people are successful applying robotics. So uh, my message to you is to get involved, to um, really understand that it's not about the technology, but it's about uh, the people who are applying it and the people that understand the technology, understand how to relate it to markets. Um, there, I have many. You know, when I think about robotics, I don't think about the technology. I think about the people I know and, and what they're doing. And so um, I really encourage you to get involved and, and help and become a part of uh, um, what's happening um, today. So thank you.